And from the Berber people, there were strong tribes of the Sanhaja, and later Masufa and Lamtuna, who not only became agents for the spreading of wealth, they were not only the guides across the desert, but they also became the agents and the spreaders of Islam as a way of life itself. And when uh, Islam penetrated the Sahra, the great desert, when it penetrated that area, it met people who were already thinking in terms of one God. And this may have been um, based upon the traditions of the past where we find in many parts of Africa that people um, had already been familiar with the Great Spirit. In any event, um, Al-Bakri, one of the famous geographers from Andalusia, he records uh, in his text in the year 1068, he brings valuable information on three very famous Islamic empires. The empire of Gao, the empire of Takror, and the empire of Ghana. And three, these three empires are, are very important to us, not only for our study of Islam uh, in Africa, but it, they are important because um, they're, they're teaching Islamization. They're, they're teaching what happens uh, to Islam when it meets traditional religion. And it shows the different um, strategies uh, used by Muslims. Uh, some of them are valid, some of them are not valid. But um, they are important to understand the experience of Muslims and what happened uh, to the believers when they encountered very strong um, religions based on idolatry and very powerful sorcerers and magicians as were found in West Africa at the time. The first of these three empires was Gao. And Gao was ruled by um, a king who accepted Islam, but at the same time um, he wanted to benefit also from the traditional religion. So the king was a Muslim, and his royal emblem uh, stayed uh, Islamic, but the common people on the ground continued to worship idols. Also, many pre-Islamic customs persisted within the society. Magic persisted in society. And the, the, the king himself, and this trend uh, that he set, is one who tries to get the best of both worlds, as they would say. He's an imam during the day and a sorcerer at night. If he cannot defeat you by making dua to Allah, then he, he wraps up a spell and then throws it on you uh, when he meets you in battle. And so this is a way of approaching Islam. It, 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 it's syncretism, it's mixing up uh, our different ideologies. But we have to, to recognize that this is what happened to Islam in many parts of the world. The second um, uh, of these three empires was the empire of Takror. And this was founded around the year 1040. It is a very old uh, empire. And the people of Takror became famous because of their strict adherence to the teachings of Islam. They were basically Wolof, Wolof people and Berbers. And um, they won over their society completely to Islam. And the king was very serious about his practice to the point where he compelled the people within his society to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he did not tolerate um, uh, idol worship or magic or any other form of, of religion or worship within the boundaries of his Islamic state. And Takroa became um, uh, very famous uh, for the powerful stance of the people. And also they appear to be the first or the, or the oldest of the Hujjaj, of the pilgrims who went to Mecca to Mukarramah. So the people of Mecca still remember the, the Takroa people as being the, the basis or the foundation of West African society. The third uh, of these great uh, empires established in West Africa, uh, which was established around 1076 or so in its final form, was the empire of Ghana. And this was ancient Ghana, because this does not represent the country of Ghana today. Ancient Ghana would probably fall in what is now known as Mauritania and, and, and Senegal. What is important about um, the, the, the Muslims who were living there in Ghana is that the head of state was a non-Muslim. And he ruled in the area of the palace, 
and of course he was the leader and master of the people in his society. The Muslims were allowed to live in an autonomous site. So when you entered into Ghana, if you were a Muslim merchant, then you would go to the Muslim quarters. There within the quarters, you would hear the adhan being called, the food was halal, the Qur'an was being studied in the different schools, uh, women were covering themselves uh, properly, and you would find everything um, that you would expect within an Islamic land, an area ruled by an emir uh, of Islam. But um, they lived within a non-Muslim state. So this again is another trend uh, that was set. The Muslims, because of their understanding of the Arabic language, uh, and because of the travel that they had and the interaction with different races and different societies, were uh, being used by the king as scribes, as accountants, as ambassadors, as merchants, and they were generally employed in the court of the king uh, to meet different foreign dignitaries who would come into the courts and also to help the king to deal with uh, contact with the Islamic world and with different uh, uh, books and treatises and different coinages with Arabic language being used. So we see now that Arabic is a very important language. I mean, not only just for religious purposes, but Arabic actually unlocks the key to the history of West Africa. It also gives you an understanding of um, what happened in societies uh, in many parts of the world. And um, the Muslims maintained their cordial relations uh, with the king. And because of this uh, diplomatic way uh, that Muslims uh, uh, functioned there in Ghana, uh, all of the Muslim merchants who came into the areas were highly respected. And it is said that when a Muslim merchant walked down the street, the people would literally uh, move to the side of the road to let the Muslims go by because they respected uh, Islam and they respected the level of scholarship um, that Muslims were functioning on. It is this state of Ghana, to this state, that the Murabitun uh, came uh, into, and they, uh, in the same 11th century, they came down into uh, the empire of Ghana, and they assisted the king, and they were calling to the good and forbidding evil. It is misunderstood, and it is mistaken information that we find in many uh, history textbooks when it, sells, when it says the al Muravids, meaning al Murabitun. It says the al Muravids sacked or destroyed the kingdom of Ghana. This is a major mistake because when we look at the writings of al Bakri and al Zuhri and the other great uh, writers from North Africa and Andalusia who were recording this information, we don't find any information of the Murabitun actually coming into the area, destroying the society and killing the king. They actually assisted the king, and the proof of that is the fact that the king outlived them. And if they destroyed uh, the society and killed the king, it would have become clear. What is important for us here, above all, is that Muslims established a commercial diaspora. It was a complicated set of, of trading bases which were linked together by the trade routes and by the Arabic language. So Arabic became a lingua franca. It became a language of trade, of scholarship, of literacy, and young people of all nationalities, Muslim and non-Muslim, tried to learn the Arabic so that they could come into a higher level of civilization and they could be involved in international trade and meeting people of all different nations and all different tribes. Also, um, Arabic and Islam uh, opened up the way for Sharia. So a, a, the, the, the common legal system that was being used by the merchants in North Africa, in the desert region, and down into West Africa was the Islamic Sharia system. So if there was a difference of opinion, they would turn to Sharia in order to find out the best way to solve their problem. People came into Islam in large numbers. Eventually, Ghana faded from the scene, and in its place came the empire of Mali. Mali was a very important and dominating empire. And from the year 1050, the people of Mali, the Mandinka people, Soninke people, 
they had a very strong impact upon West African society. But when their king became Muslim, it linked them to the international trade routes and it opened up a way for knowledge. A very interesting story is related to us about how the king came into Islam. It is said that the king, being a non-Muslim and his society, was suffering from a terrible drought in the 11th century. A Muslim, educated, having basic understanding of Islam, came into the, the region and sat with the king to understand what was the problem. The king told him about the drought and the difficulties of the people, and the Muslim said very clearly to him, if you want to solve your problems, then you should accept Islam. You should submit to the creator of the heavens, the creator of the rain, the creator of the clouds. And then when you pray, uh, maybe your prayers could be accepted. After a period of time, the king accepted Islam. The Muslim scholar then told the king, you need to purify yourself. So the king purified himself and the scholar gave him garments of cotton. So he put on the white cotton garments and together the scholar and the king prayed. They spent the whole evening on a high raised mound praying. The scholar would make dua, he would pray, and the king would say, Amin. And they continued to do this all of the night. At the break of dawn, when the light started to come, the rain poured down all over Mali. And the king accept, you know, then confirmed his Islam. He ordered, he, he ordered all of the idols to be broken. He expelled the magicians from his country. And since then, all of the rulers of Mali have been Muslims. This is a powerful testimony to the presence of Islam. After this time, Mansa, Mansa Uli made pilgrimage to Mecca. He expanded Mali and he incorporated Timbuktu and many other cities. Another ruler named Mansa Suleiman ruled in from 1337 to 1359. He built mosques, strengthened Islamic culture, and he was visited by Ibn Battuta, the famous uh, Islamic traveler who had traveled all over the planet. He describes Mali within his writings, and he says very clearly, it was the most peaceful country that I ever visited. And so we again have unlocked a gem of knowledge about the complex society in West Africa. And now we need to look deeper into what happened in the past. I leave you with this thought. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.